well hello that's me again today is december 1 2023 so we have one month to run you know this uh year to the end of it and then hopefully 2024 will bring us more i don't know what it's going to bring us really the way things develop it's just absolutely incredible i never experienced anything uh in uh, like this in my life and uh that requires pretty much constantly commenting on things which unfold but uh as you know my main principle is to single out the most important event some of them might might not look uh, to many of the observers as that important but believe me they have an immense influence on the shaping of our present world which is already de facto it is fait accompli multipolar and i will start with the news that actually uh the marinka obviously has fallen russians already hoisted the russian armed forces hoisted the flag there and to understand you what is happening in terms of the what's left of ukraine and its armed forces let me show you something for you to keep in mind what the level of tragedy actually because of the brainwashed people who have been thrown under the bus by now by their western curators this is a very interesting certificate of the um, affidavit basically of the some of the guy who ex, uh, as you can see yourself it's uh, in the red frame he had his uh, uh, above one third of his calf uh, amputated so he is an uh, basically disabled person but guess what he is still good for military service albeit in a, some limited capacity uh, while we may can make uh, all jokes we can, uh, can about this well definitely tragedy for this person but the point is I mean yeah sure he has two two hands left I mean maybe head is still there so why not to throw him back into some kind of well if not the trench the summary of services he can shoot right well, if that hasn't been enough, these are the photos of the 103rd Brigade of the Territorial um, Defense of Ukraine. Uh, as you can see yourself, these are teenagers and they have been drafted now they are called orphans of the uh, orphans of their fathers their fathers have been all killed on the front so as you can see yourself this is your hitler jugend hitler youth well that's what it is and as you can see yourself yeah the kids i don't know 16 the most 17 probably that's about it i would say the kids what can I say so and they are already drafted in the armed forces of Ukraine they will be thrown in the tr trenches and they will be killed sadly as Mr. Shaigu already stated today there are uh, you can see it's uh, everywhere including uh, Russia today it's uh, their counter uh, offense <laughs> so to speak of um, Ukraine um, it's about 125,000 uh, casualties but uh, yeah in terms of killed I mean yeah just let's not go there we already know the number is terrifying so but that brings us to this which is actually uh, I wanted to talk seriously about the whole situation we have this economist as already stated uh, and you know my attitude I don't take them seriously at all the only reason the only reason I sometimes pay attention to all those tabloids from the UK is because they are also as it is the case with the tabloids in the United States which are all corporate media CNN or foreign affairs it's all tabloid they don't don't write anything serious they don't uh, express any valid ideas they basically do rumors and propaganda and that's why they are important because they reflect a degree of the you know attitude among so-called elites and again elite is the nominal term so to speak none of those people have enough culture or class or what education to be called elites but hey they some of them are bought by other people with money so and you have this kind the, you know vicious circle of the uh, basically I scratch your back you scratch mine and as a result uh, neither uh, uh, Europe nor United States have a real press anymore real media except if they are alternative ones but here it is still the economies those people which have no clue what war is and yet they come with this uh, um, uh, yesterday they come with this uh, title or headline that Putin seems to be winning the war in Ukraine for now his biggest asset in Europe is Europe's lack of strategic vision 
And this is some kind of how to put it polite, sickness of words. They have no meaning whatsoever. Practically everything people in uh, UK, especially all those journalists or something like, uh, you know, uh, all those uh, military experts or intelligence experts, most of what they write is sequence of the words, uh, whose only uh, uh, b b point is to obfuscate or basically uh, alleviate the butt hurt and being a sore loser because West already lost the war and I can tell you what is the, this all about because uh, here's the uh, Mr. Andrei Ilnitsky uh, as you can see yourself he is actually uh, the guy who is an advisor of Sergei Shaigu of Minister of Defense and Andrei Ilnitsky he has an outstanding background not only he graduated the legendary MFTE Moscow Physical Technical Institute with uh, he has PhD he is the uh, well not PhD he's doctor of the uh, uh, technical sciences he has an extremely strong engineering and scientific background he also graduated the Academy of the General Staff and so and, and the other things the guy has like I don't know how many degrees he has all of them extremely complex and well he's probably genius he also the author of the mental war concept which is basically uh, he was discussing uh, this for number of years now about the uh, basically the only war the uh, combined West can conduct against Russia is the mental one it's propaganda it's the issue of ideology and here's very important thing this is him three days ago and he was talking about on the 20 fifth uh, all uh, uh, whole world Russian National Sabor Sabor is gathering basically it's a very charge it's Russian uh, you know uh, term of the gathering and it was on the 20 cents uh, 27th of November in in this uh, speech he gives the explanation of why West hates Russia and why I mean uh, it's all primarily about mental war propaganda media you know the internet all this thing to instill all those uh, uh, <clears throat> so to speak the western values and western uh, patterns of behavior which of course we already know it's uh, it's basically the main driver which brought the west down and that is why it lost in ukraine and it's losing elsewhere and it will continue for a while and he was uh, talking about this and most important thing during his speech he stated he said um yeah i just returned from china he said just a few days ago and i was talking with the chinese uh you know uh top brass people political and military people of course he has a he is a guy of the very big statue and he said Chinese already told us guys you already won and he said they obviously take it um, a little bit you know different time frame uh, approach to the history because obviously of the length of the Chinese civilization and he said yeah uh, they were just absolutely in in full awe and admiration of uh, how it was done and say yeah you won and you cannot even understand the scale of your victory because essentially it's going to be uh, but we know I mean it's not like Russians don't know Russian people who run Russia they understand it although we still cannot completely uh, count for all ramifications and the other thing which came out uh, today in Zgliad also very interesting on how Russia is breaking up and breaking off from the West and not uh, just uh, economically or uh, you know in any strategic sense it is mental it is spiritual and here's the article by Vadim Trukhachov here today in Zgliad where he writes that the United States is not always to blame for European Russophobia which I absolutely agree I and I was I'm on record you can look it up my old videos that I always say hey United States didn't necessarily have to you know incite Russophobia or I mean just acute hatred of Russia among uh, not just elites but among a European population people of course I know there will be immediately people going up in arms in uh, 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 um, discussion board to this video and I totally agree with them they will say no for example I'm British or you know I'm Portuguese 
this or whatever. We don't hate Russia. I agree. There is a significant strata of people in Europe who do not view Russia as an enemy or do not view Russia as the threat. And they do not hate Russians. In fact, many of them admire Russian culture. But we have to keep in mind it is all about numbers. Those people are still a minority, <laughs> majority of people. Look what Finland has done to itself. It's basically killing itself. And what is happening to Europe, economically especially, it is absolutely unprecedented. N never I saw anything like this. Just to give you an example, Mrs. Uh, you know, Frau von der Lugen. I mean, the, uh, she is absolute, I mean, clueless. She's a bimbo, basically. And she runs, you know, the, uh, uh, the Europe, so to speak. And Commission Chief says that defense strategy is incomplete without Ukraine. And now she offers, that. <laughs> she, she said that uh, Ukraine should be integrated into the European Union defense programs to help cater to its needs in its war against the Russian invasion. And here's the other thing, you know, uh, how the Europe can integrate <laughs> Hate anything uh, uh, in terms of the military pro uh, programs when Europe doesn't produce good weapons realistically and actually it cannot produce them enough and that is why uh, kind of I want to um, get you into the most important thing about the uh, how to put it uh, the desperation <laughs> It's I cannot even describe it. I put it into my blog yesterday, but and Garland Nixon sent me this article. And I'm all like, oh my god! So we have the national interest. On two days ago, they write that, and there's some Andre Matil and Denis Soltis. Both guys are Ukrainians. They work in some kind of the again, you know, think tank, and they are, as you might have guessed, it, political science majors. That means they don't have any education. They don't understand what warfare is, but Look at this. They came up with the new thing to cover up the, the a catastrophe, not only for Ukraine, but for the West there. And they called that Stasis is not the stalemate in the Ukrainian war. Contra contrary to the doom mongers, there is no rationale for Ukraine to make concessions and in effect agree to capitulation. And they begin to explain that no, the there is not stalemate, it's a Stasis. Or stasis. Well, the problem, of course, there's no stal stalemate either, and Russia continues to slowly moving uh, ahead. I mean, recapturing new territories, as it was the case today with Marinka. Avdiivka is completely surrounded, and they just basically been uh, killed there. I mean, in industrial quantities. So, um, yeah, and we can sit here and discuss the strategy of Russia and whatever Vladimir Putin wants to uh, do with uh, Ukraine in, in, you know, in final decision. Uh, go to Duran guys, uh, Alex uh, uh, and Alexander, they speak about it, especially in terms of speech of Vladimir Putin and the fact that uh, Sergei Lavrov today stated uh, when uh, talking about the meeting in Mac Macedonia, in this uh, uh, organization of the European Security and Cooperation. Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Borrell, he said, just ran away. I mean, they just, you know, were afraid to meet me. He said, I'm not running away, but they don't want to meet, of course, because we already can see ourselves that the whole process of governing in the United States is seizing. It's just, it's ungovernable in many respects because it's basically the whole so-called strategies as they want to call it in reality it's not really a strategy even it's absolutely i mean it's completely destroyed decomposed completely and everything falling apart for them and that brings us to their uh, documents which i want to point out as being extremely important for understanding of the situation and they i never saw in my life two fundamental national level strategic <laughs> documents to get, uh, to get obsolete so fast. We will start with the national security strategy. October 2022, remember, Russia was running at that time out of everything, out of missiles, out of shells, out of personnel, you know, 100 trillion of Russians have been killed, and so on, and Ukraine was winning. So that tells you that those people who were writing and saying that they had no clue. And here it is. It's a White House. It's a basically, you know, president and his team. And here what they say in national security strategy. And look at this. 
they of course uh, i can tell you immediately uh the uh language uh, uh, verbiage of those documents uh, guys uh, even communist party uh reports on the communist party congress and soviet union had less pathos and bs stuffed into them but look what they talk about in national security strategy about modernizing and strengthening our military and they said guess for where they start from the american military is the strongest fighting force the world has ever known well of course uh you know napoleon or kutuzov or even manstein they would have like you know their own uh, opinion about that so will M marshall zhukov but you know what hey whatever words are cheap and they that's what they do because the only thing they can do is pr and verbiage and they say America will not hesitate to use force when necessary to defend our national interest. Well, you have to understand that you have to define your national interest. But we will do so as the last resort and only when the objective and missions are clear and achievable. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we can see yourself there in Ukraine, with all this basically short of uh, direct involvement of uh, U.S. Army uh, combat troops, the United States is fully in engaged there together with NATO. But they say, consistent with our values and laws alongside non-military tools and mission is undertaken with the informed consent of the American people. This is the, uh, as I already stated, the sequence of the absolutely meaningless words which do not reflect reality because obviously they are euphemisms or doublespeak you know this is full-blown Orwell here and uh, it's not only you know the, it's not doublespeak a double thing too you know so and they just start to describe this you know that how our starting premise is that a powerful U.S. military helps advance and safeguard vital U.S. national interests by backstopping diplomacy, confronting aggression, deterring conflict, projecting strengths, and protecting the American people and their economic interests. First, uh, obviously, we have to understand why when people present this as a strategic document, which is stuffed with all those pathos political statements, that means you can discount it because it's absolutely useless and as you saw yourself practically every intentions which is described even in this part of the document and believe me all other parts are pretty much the same it is all political statements which have no relation whatsoever to american uh, modus operandi and of course in this case it is written primarily for BSing people inside the united states and you know what uh considering the fact of the intellectual level of the european uh, elites that's basically you know blowing the smoke up their asses reality is uh, United States nobody wants to attack United States uh, United States posture defensive posture is nothing more than imperialist posture it's uh, actually expeditionary warfare posture and it is all about fighting there uh, there while nobody really tries to attack it here and but guess what it is also bankrupting country because the united states simply cannot afford the force which it has today and so if not to be you know empty uh, so kind of shaking the air without any proofs here we have another national defense strategy this is already u.s department of defense again look at this 2022 including nuclear posture review and uh, 2022 defense review when you read those documents and they state all those statements we intend we will or we should do and whatever you begin to ask the question uh what kind of resources do they have for that this is not to say that america is not necessarily small economy no it is still the second economy by size in the world but it is uh, actually dwarfed for example by china and russia i dare say that has the economy of about half the size of the united states but guess what and they are obsessed in with russia in this national defense uh, uh strategy guess what that uh, right about russia about evolving uh you know air and missile threat environment and they say that well of course they lie they unprovoked russian invasion of ukraine clearly signals their emergence of a more militaristic russia that seeks to overturn the post-cold war european security system <laughs> 
challenge the broader rules-based international order. So rules-based, of course, you know, it's a euphemism for Pax Americana, for United States ordering everybody around while thinking that they are so strong. United States is not as strong as it uh, uh, thinks it is and now actually many people be begin to believe that United States is actually in a very weakened mili military sense but here it is look at this this is again October 2022 in Ukraine Russia has used thousands of air land and sea launch crews and ballistic missiles including hypersonic missiles current battlefield losses threaten to reduce Russia modernized weapons arsenal and coordinated and wide-ranging economic sanctions and export control may hinder hinder the future ability to effectively produce modern precision guided munition of course uh, people who wrote it in pentagon they have no clue and as i already stated i begin to doubt uh, actually the competence not all everybody but majority of people who graduate from west point and then go and go into the year's army war college or go into the uh, basically uh, command and general staff college in 11th verse kansas because evidently those people who write this they have no clue what they're writing about especially when you look at today's russia's economic growth of 5.5 percent and uh, military industrial complex of russia firing of one cylinders but then again it is october 2022 these are people who are writing it they were believing this and they really believe that russia ran out of missiles and uh, uh you know um, artillery shells and personnel and here they have as noted in national defense strategy russia also seeks to advance its interests by directly challenging u.s national interests no russia is not challenging u.s national interests russia challenges u.s uh, national aggression which is essentially blinding the world because united states cannot conduct serious large-scale combined arms war it's just the fact of life and they cannot live with this fact anymore they need to you know obfuscate it with all those pathos and big words but in reality they know that again what is the length what is the sustainability or military uh, uh what is called balance of the even if to imagine as i already many times uh, stated the uh u.s army force fully deployed in, in, in near let's say ukraine couple of weeks i would say and that's about it if assume that united states doesn't go full-blown nuclear because it will lose it and again the, uh, the we already know from parameters magazine and um, smart people who do, do the uh, operational um planning in pentagon they already stated yeah if united states can handle 3600 casualties a day so yeah sure but we know that it's not the case and uh, army will disintegrate but we will continue to and they continue to you know speak about russia that is developing and fielding a suite of advanced precision strike missiles that can be launched from the multiple air sea and ground-based platforms so how does this statement uh actually goes with the fact that it hinder future military ability to effectively produce modern precision guided munitions it contradicts itself within the same basically uh paragraph the reason being of course that uh you know those documents are becoming primarily propaganda documents and have very little to do with the reality they do however they do however point out that when they talk about uh, approach to force planning aims to build strengths and capability in key operational areas to maintain informational advantage the department will improve its ability to integrate defend and reconstitute our surveillance and decision systems to achieve war fighting objectives particularly in space domain it's obviously it's a good intention and the united states definitely is a major superpower uh, in terms of space exploration but again you know uh russia can shut down the uh, u.s uh, military uh, and uh, civilian which the united states pentagon uses as their uh, 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 um, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets uh, pretty fast 48 hours and it will be degraded to such a point that the united states will not be able to operate its forces if they are deployed in europe for example but they write here correct things to enhance our ability to deny aggression we will improve the speed and accuracy of detection and targeting to mitigate adversary and uh, adversary anti-access area denial capability the department will develop concepts and capabilities that improve our ability to reliably hold at risk those 
Force military forces and assets that are essential to adversary operations. It is also wet dreams because they will work only for the second, third rate military powers. United States doesn't have salvo resources which can degrade it, especially against highly developed uh, uh, air defense and anti-missile systems, and of course uh, against the uh, uh, basically assets which will shoot back. And unlike the United States, for example, Russia in terms of missile technologies, it's so far ahead, it's not even funny to talk about. That is why there is a lot of uh, those uh, basically, how to put it, palliative uh, discussions on the issue of hypersonics which United States doesn't have it doesn't have uh, genuine hypersonic weapons and it's not just about hypersonics I mean the United States doesn't even have uh, supersonic missiles be them anti-shipping or any kind of other types of the missiles including land attack that simply doesn't have it and I doubt it will develop it because we have the issue with the of course industrial base and R&D in United States no United States still maintains a very significant industrial base and it is uh, there are still many smart people which are being graduated but generally the level of the technical exp and industrial expertise is basically diving you know and we are I don't know what we're looking at by 2030 and uh, then, of course, they, uh, in, uh, they continue with this document that, yeah, our current system is too slow. Aha, uh -huh, they admit. And too focused on acquiring systems not designed to address the most critical challenge we now face. The orientation leaves little incentive to design open systems that can rapidly incorporate cutting-edge technologies. Well, that's the uh, basically modus operandi of the uh, U.S. military industrial complex. As I already stated uh, and wrote three books, write the fourth one, American weapons are designed for sale. They're not designed for fighting a real serious war, let alone about the enemy as Russia, for example. So I don't know. In terms of air defense, again, the United States is uh, way below Russia in the league of the air defense missile technology. Same goes for pretty much whole host of uh, basically the uh, hardware and uh, operational concepts, especially which are being developed by Russians during their uh, special military operation. And here they are, make the right technology investment. The United States technological age has long been a foundation of our military advantage. No, United States doesn't have military advantage anymore and it didn't have it for a long time now. The department will support the da 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 blah 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 blah. Yes, sure, they do. Guess what they want? They want advanced capabilities, including direct energy and hypersonics, integrating system and cyber. We, I don't see uh, what United States can do in terms of hypersonics because, as I already stated, eventually it will get there. Make no mistake, take the American engineers and American uh, type of education still. STEM education is world class, so they might be able to produce uh, some kind of their, uh, you know, uh, weapon. But Dark Eagle, you already know, it hasn't been deployed, and it's probably not going to be deployed throughout 2024. And again, we don't know what are the technical issues there, but believe me, it's still not there. But also, that brings us to a very interesting, uh, so to speak. Uh, part about all that and how United States gave us and of course Europeans gave us the lesson on how not to plan for war and how to overestimate your dramatically your activity uh, I mean capabilities uh, here's the uh, basically from European Union it was yesterday the transatlantic tech summit postponed as platform loses steam the high-level meeting of the EU-US Trade and Technology Council had been officially postponed, confirming that the initiative has slipped down the priority list on both sides of the pond. What does it mean? It means only one thing, that Europe technologically will not be uh, no sharing between uh, uh, United States and Europe because United States has its lunch, as already many times stated, that Europe is uh, economically stagnant and it's going to be done pretty much soon in history historical terms, that it will be deindustrialized, and there is no point for United States to share pretty much with anything or discuss anything, because in the end, for example, countries like Netherlands, for example, which is also, a, I mean, wildly Russophobic country, or, uh, you know, the 
Italy or Spain, they will have their hands twisted and they will buy whatever United States sells them in terms of their uh, military technology and they will get those tanks, you know, Leopard. Look at what happened to their reputation of leopards, and now they will draw Abrams tanks from Ukraine because they don't want to feel, you know, humiliated when they will begin to burn. And they believe me, they will begin to burn. And uh, to understand, to explain to you the level of the butt hurt, here's their old, you know, uh, cadres of the. <laughs> <laughs> we can outlast Russia and Ukraine, Lord Cameron tells NATO. It was two days ago. And he's talking about NATO can outlast Russia and Ukraine. David Cameron told the lies on Wednesday, saying its combined economic might was 30 times greater than Moscow. The guy needs to go back to school and learn arithmetic. He needs to learn how to count, really. And I mean, when you look at the, the imbecility of this whole, I don't know how to comment. I mean, these people are delusional. And you say, oh, yeah, they're, they're delusional for the public only. No, many of them believe that. That's why they're losing everything. But so, and he talk, talks about that, yeah, to deliver Kiev enough weapons to defeat Vladimir Putin's force. Yeah, he have to go and ask in UK what kind of weapons you can, can deliver, uh, with the exception of the Storm Shadow or Scout missiles. Uh, yeah, Challenger um, went once, uh, two of them have been immediately burned. They already withdrew them back because it is humiliation for the basically NATO technology. It is not done for fighting real serious war. But if this hasn't been enough, and if we uh, didn't have enough explanation how the even strategic documents uh, of the United States be become obsolete pretty much, you can see yourself that actually uh, uh, Europeans kind of begin to uh, admit, you know, what the however securing orders of weapons, especially missiles and ammunition with the defense industry and pushing for the faster production is not going quite as planned. Three NATO diplomats <laughs> told your active uh, 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 media, raising the question of whether the West can hold the line in the next month. No, it cannot. It's already lost. But hey, whatever. I mean, they kind of can do whatever they want. But look at this. If that hasn't been enough, evidently Russia and China, oh my gosh. Russia, three days ago, ratified the legal uh, uh, agreement and the uh, treaty with uh, China to build, guess what? Uh, it's building the lunar station. And it's uh, Roscosmos on one side and China National Space Administration. And the project is planned to be implemented in three stages. And actually, it explains to you what kind of stages uh, are those. We do not need to uh, basically uh, concentrate on them now. The document is out there and people read it. So the third stage, of course, is the development of, and placing of the station on the moon. And here what we have that Russia will do the part. It's... Uh, 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 Financing of work on the Russian side is already you know, basically ongoing for the Luna Globe and Luna Resource One space complexes will be carried out without within the framework of Russian space program. So that's so much for the gas station, isn't it? So, and um, in conclusion, in conclusion, I know people ask me, and uh, it's a painful question for me, believe me, because I have the Armenian relatives by marriage, and uh, I'm, I have many wonderful Armenian friends, and uh, they're uh, good people, believe me, they are suffering seeing what is happening to their uh, country of orange in Armenia, which is beca becomes basically, it will become the, another, you know, cannon fodder against Russia. But people, and we will, I'll talk about it, I promise you. But uh, Armenia is done, and uh, obviously those diaspora which they love to, you know, appeal to, they're not going to help. It's uh, People sometimes don't understand the economic and military scale of things. But look at this. This is in the conclusion why Armenia is needed and why Pashinyan sold everything. And this is just kind of, you know, short note. You see this? This is North-South Corridor. And as you can see yourself, it's much shorter. And guess what? It is being built as we speak now. Already it is being used, actually, as you can see yourself. It is from Russia and its main industrial areas through Russian South, through Azerbaijan, through Iran, and then, of course, onto India. This is huge cut in distance in terms of the delivery of the goods. 
and as you can see yourself, Armenia stuck next to Azerbaijan becomes the main, basically the beachhead or bridgehead, if you wish, for the NATO and West to s trying to sabotage this corridor, which is already operating, not in the full strength, but it's already working. So this is the main geopolitical issue there, and that is why, for example, um, well, uh, Russia and Azerbaijan have actually pretty damn good relations between them. And there are may still many Russians living in Azerbaijan. So if people don't know this, there are actually many Russian schools in Baku, for example. So that explains you a little bit. And this is what I wanted to, uh, you know, finish my conversation today with you with. And um, what can I say? Um, it is what it is. And uh, this is the first day of December, guys. And let's hope that we will have some peaceful resolutions to, to more things in uh, many conflicts around the world which are happening. And this comes obviously with the Russian battle of a gun at the NATO's temple right now. And this is what I wanted to tell you. So as usual, guys, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And those who can afford, please support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee and too. And again, my profound gratitude to my wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, patrons, guys. Without you, I wouldn't be able to do this. So what can I say, guys? It is Friday and uh, weekend coming. Have a nice weekend. And I'll talk to you later. Bye bye.